we have Manny Roman, um, the CEO of PIMCO. Most of you know well, um, PIMCO manages altogether $1.8 trillion compared to the $1.5 trillion that Manny had when he started this job. Um, Manny, welcome. Very nice to see you again. Um, nice to see you, John. Let's begin, let's begin with the economy. Um, you had a rather nice economic outlook quite recently, earlier in June, where the long climb, and you quoted the Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin, where the economy rode the elevator down, but will have to climb the stairs back up. Is that the way you look at the recovery at the moment, that it's going to take longer and not be as rapid as some people hope? It's correct. And I think, I think there's a lot of things we know and there's a lot of things we don't know. But we expect real GDP to come back to the 2019 level by the end of 2021. And so there is going to be a lot of repair to be done in the system. There are sectors where the degree of predictability is very high in terms of what may happen. There are other sectors, retail, oil and gas, leisure, gaming, where there's a lot of things we don't know. As much as I would like to tell you that we can predict consumer behavior and how people are going to use anything from airlines to movie theater, we just don't know. And so when I think of the next 12 months, the error rate has to be much higher in terms of prediction. Just, just, just quickly coming back on that, you said there were some areas where you did feel fairly confident. What would be the areas where you think you can predict, you, you sort of think you know what's going to happen? Oh, I think the tech sector tells you everything you need to know about uh, what has been predictable. And if, if I think back in the situation we were on March 15 and 16, if you had told us that the NASDAQ is nearly up 10% on the year, uh, I would have been shocked. And so the recovery of the stock market has been nothing short of extraordinary. And tech companies have done remarkably well and seems to be, for the most part, totally unaffected by recent events. Well, do you think those valuations are justified? I mean, surely you, you'd use the word surprising. Um, that would sound as if you don't think that the tech got text stock should be quite that high again. Well, I'm hardly an expert on tech stock, but let's talk about credit for, for one second. I think that yeah. you've seen an enormous amount of issuance in the credit space from the end of March to today. And we have bridged the liquidity gap. Then there is going to be a long cycle where firm will need to think about solvency and their own businesses and what they can achieve. And if we know anything from history, we know it's a long cycle. It's a cycle where there'll be repair to be done and where some sectors are going to be profoundly affected and will need restructuring. Just think of the airline sector. Um, when are we going to see each other in the flesh, John? And I don't know that. I don't know whether it's two weeks away or whether it's six months away. Part of it is also uh, the virus, of course, where irrespective of how much work we've done in terms of understanding the risk and keeping our people safe, there's also things we don't know. And as you see cases taking up in 26 of the states in America, there's a, just a lot of unknown in terms of people's behavior and what people are willing to do or not. You see the best sort of risk return balance in that. And the moment you have the Fed buying everything, and supporting the markets. Um, where do you see the best return, given what you've just said about credit? You, you said that you're worried about that. Well, I would just point out one thing, which I think is interesting. So for, you know, if you, if you look at the US cycles, distress is a long cycle, and the ability to deploy capital to restructuring situation is actually the opportunity to deliver outsized returns. It takes time. You don't have to hurry, but it's something that we're focusing on. And if there are opportunity to buy cheap businesses and cheap credit because of all the factors that we just mentioned and the ability to put them in the correct fund structure with the correct liquidity, I think the industry 
will deliver outsized returns. And you've seen that for the first time, I would say, in the SNL crisis in 1991. Then you saw that again in the Asian crisis in 97, 98. Then you saw that in the tech and telco unwinding in 2001 and 2002. And then you saw obviously a lot in 2000 and 2009, and, and, and hopefully PIMCO will thrive out of these markets and find plenty of opportunities to invest money. PIMCO is one of the famous winners from what happened in 2008 and 2009. Is there a particular area that you think will work for you in the same way as it did then? Then you avoided subprime and then you bought very well at, afterwards. Is there, is there something that you particularly want to focus on this time? I think we bought. I think we bought very well, and and, and all all uh, all credit to Dan Iverson uh, at the time, and and I think there were a lot of sleepless nights. So so I think I think one has to be incredibly humble in terms of uh, in terms of where we go forward. But I think that uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity in the sectors that I mentioned, which are being challenged, to buy cheap assets, and also for most of what we do, to avoid risky sectors, and actually be defensive in terms of making sure that we don't own things that break but there are sectors that we feel quite positive you know think for example of the housing market we think housing is in uh, is in pretty good shape so the whole mortgage market if it provides opportunity is actually pretty steady we think that housing in the us doesn't have enough supply and that house prices give or take are reasonably stable given what we know can I ask you about a particular thing, which is the role of central banks? Um, there's a very good article in Foreign Affairs by our, our mutual friend, Sebastian Malaby, called The Age of Magical Money. And what it points out is that after the last financial crisis, the central bank stepped in and printed a vast amount of money. I think it was up to about $15 trillion. This time, they're already close to $10 trillion, and we've barely been through a, a year as opposed to a decade. How much does that impact your thinking? Surely at some time people have got to undeal, you know, unwrap that. Well, it, it, it of course impacts. I mean, it's a very good question. It's impacting us a lot. And we, we've seen what the ECB has done and how it has mutualized the risk of various country. Uh, if you, we had had this conversation 15 years ago and we would have tried, you and I, to predict the spreads of mm. Italian government bond, we, we would not have come remotely close to where they are today. And it, the other can I, example- Can I come back at you? Can I come back at you about Italy? Because by coincidence, I was going to pry you on that. You look at Italy. Italy has got vast amounts of debt against, um, against GDP, well over 100%, 130%. It has got um, some problems in the financial system, and yet it is trading at minuscule spreads, not just above German bonds, but above zero. Does that make sense to you? Well, it, makes sense, fact, it, it makes sense in a mutualization uh, system where the ECB is essentially buying a lot of the bonds and driving the price down. And it's no surprise. And I think that you can think of the ECB as a way to transfer credit risk from the best credit, in that case, uh, Germany and, uh, and the Netherlands, to weaker credit and essentially having um, the ability to borrow and the ability to buy assets to level which um, are not equilibrium level, but level which are driven by a lot of purchase. And the one thing I would say is, for example, we think that the Italian banking sector is in good shape. Um, so there are things in Italy which are working the right way. Uh, there's an industrial sector that will need to recover from uh, post-COVID um, situation, but has a lot of good companies in the north of Italy and should be a very good exporter. So there are things working in Italy also. So I don't want to give you a bleak picture of, uh, of what I think the Italian situation is. And, uh, and, and hopefully there'll be more supply side reform uh, in terms of competitiveness and in terms of company being able to, uh, to grow the business. In America, to what extent do you feel as if you're betting against the Fed in a strange way? You, you, the, the Fed is sitting there and underwriting so much. Does that make it difficult for someone who, who is an active fund manager? You're not just buying an index. So, so you know, we have this say, John, we say don't bet against the Fed. And as far as we can tell, the Fed hasn't bought much. The Fed has signaled a total commitment to step in if need be. And you've got to give them real credit because the world looks 
like a very different place from March 17. And they acted very swiftly and we needed it. And maybe the total crisis of liquidity we saw in the first two weeks of March was due to the fact that people work home. But I also think that it was due to an enormous amount of stress in the system and something that no one had ever been confronted to, except for our colleagues working in Asia through the swine and the pig flu. And to much of their credit, they acted and they acted quite swiftly. How much they buy at the end, you can make a very decent argument that the signaling is actually more important than the actual amount that they buy. But once again, I don't want to understate the amount of restructuring that will need to happen in all of the various industry in terms of sizing up the business, sizing up leverage ratio, figuring out how much stock they can buy back, figuring out the headcount, figuring out outsourcing. I don't need to tell you, you will know that better than me, but we're going to be in the next six months in an election campaign. There'll be a lot of noise about China. So outsourcing is also going to be a big issue. We may see some inflation down the line. There's a lot of variables that come into the picture. When do you see inflation coming back? Does that come back just purely because there's been so much money either pumped into the system or implied and the fact that asset prices are so high? I think it's the labor market where you see at some point in time some, some, some inflation. It's, of course, uh, linked to commodity, but I think Joachim Fels, who's a head economist, says inflation coming back slowly to the 2.3, 2.4 level over the next couple of years. Uh, and, 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 and I think that the days of the inflation that we grew up with are gone. So I don't want to, I don't want to sound anything but uh, measure in terms of what we say about inflation, but it's something that we'll have to look at. And we don't think the Fed is going to raise rates for a very long time. And so what is the, the most likely, the most likely scenario. You, what, is, what is the trigger? What is the trigger where you might see what, what numbers would you look for on inflation? What, what kind of early indicators would you look for? I think it would be a continuing number of data points where you would see inflation coming back. And the Fed has learned its lesson from hiking too fast in 2005 and 2008 and 18. The Fed would not be keen to create a temper tantrum. And I think we think they would be quite measured in terms of what they do. They would need to see real sign of inflation before they do anything. We talked a great deal about the Fed and central banks, but governments have also been pumping money into the system. There's been a vast sort of surplus. How do you think that unwinds? Do you think that we're living in an age where governments are just going to borrow more money? Or do you think that this is something where there has to be a kind of reckoning? I think for the foreseeable future, um, you're going to see government with big balance sheet. Uh, you know, one of the one of the example that we can think about is the Japanese example where you have a very high leverage ratio at the government level and where the government owns 50 percent of the JGB in circulation and essentially rates which are equal to zero. And if you look at the Japanese example, it's certainly not the example you want and it's certainly not the outcome that you want to see happen. So fiscal about- stimulus can be very important and finding other solution than monetary uh, practices. Do you see this as a time when reform will come to government in the West? You hope so. You hope so that uh, Congress can uh, think about the issues. I think I think the issue in terms of structural reform, tax code, uh, mobility, all of these things really matter. Uh, and it's true for the US, it's of course true for Europe and the competitiveness of Europe over the long run and the fact that in a, in a global market, we need to have um, European companies being competitive, which is not a given. Um, and I think, I think that will be addressed by supply uh, side um, reform, not by, uh, not by anything else. So I think, I think there's a view to say that, that monetary um, theory is great, uh, but it's only part of the equation uh, and that there are other 
structural reform which will need to happen that in a global market one one needs to do. I know you you study history a lot, Manny. If you look at history at the moment, you see the performance of what's happened in Asia in terms of the um, response to the coronavirus. And you look at the West and you see the numbers of mortality, the difference between what's happened in the United States and certainly Britain, um, where numbers, you know, five, four hundred, three hundred in America, five, six hundred in, in Britain of people dying per million. And then the numbers in Asia, places like South Korea and Taiwan being as low as sort of seven or eight. Um, so many multiples better. Do you think that there has been a, a change in the way that you look at governments that you now think of Asia as being somewhere which is better run? Well, I don't know whether better is the term, uh, but what, what you've seen is much better outcome uh, in Asia in terms of, uh, of results. And you can look at the US as a compact. And the compact was the way the US was created, a series of states getting together and signing the union. And you see the difference of opinion in terms of what the right strategy is and what's the right of the people in terms of COVID and the ability to go to work and their own safety. And I think you see very different decision. The people of Singapore are happy to have a central planner make health decision, which may actually impact the ability to go and take a walk in the street. The French people had to deal with the police checking a piece of paper explaining why they had to go to the supermarket. I think those practices in America would be much more difficult to to enforce or to have people accept it. And I think you can see that as different views on what a contract between citizens and between the state can be. And one doesn't, one is not better than the other. It's just very different rights in terms of what you think the state should give you versus what your own personal uh, liberties are. And, and you see that all the time in terms of privacy issues with social media, something that you intimately involved with. You know, what does the state know and what does the state should know? Um, and, you know, whether technology is a way also to help uh, people dealing with COVID. I have no issue having Google know at every possible point in time where I am and whom I'm with. But I think you can make a reasonable argument against this. And, 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 and that's the tension, I think. In terms of running um, PIMCO, you talked about people not um, changing their ways. Um, you look at some people, Culpers has come out talking about many more people working from home. You have UBS, I think, this morning saying a third of their workforce will work from home. How do you see PIMCO being changed by what's happened in the virus? Well, thank you for asking this. I think I think there are changes and I think that, that will be things which will remain the same. I, I, I think of our primary duty is, is, is actually to deliver returns to investors and, and for the investment side of PIMCO, I think that we will need most people to be back uh, in the office with more distancing, with more training flaws, with having safety as a number one priority. But, you know, we, we, joke, with, we, we joke with Dan Iverson, we say that markets are pretty much efficient, so it, it's always a challenge to deliver alpha and we need all hand on, uh, on deck. And that's going to be what we need to do over the foreseeable future. Uh, the speed will be quite different. So in Asia, we have 75% of the people back at work. Um, as you said, the situation in Hong Kong and Singapore, and you know they had a very tough time, is, is fine. Europe will be at 50 in the not too distant future. Uh, Newport Beach, where people can drive to work, and actually Southern California has been a good place to be. Everything else being equal is fine. I would have told you two weeks ago, Texas was in pretty good shape, but we have a big office in Austin. But I look at the news flow like you, and I don't know whether Houston mm -hmm. is only uh, affected and whether Austin is going to be also a problem and whether young people are going to be in the street and, and socialize more, and that's a problem for us. So question mark on Texas. Uh, and New York is a problem because uh, public transport um, is the way people go to work. We have plenty of people living in Brooklyn and in New Jersey, they need to come to work. 
and we're going to need to find a way for them to come back safely. And, and, and when that happened and how we get that done is not simple. And, and, and I think the magic bullet is obviously a vaccine and the fact that um, people feel comfortable that they can come and work um, without being feeling that them and their family are being threatened. You mentioned this idea of trying to deliver alpha to try to do better. Do you think that the dynamic between um, people who, are to, who take and, and put their money into index funds, active and passive management, has that in any way been changed by what has happened with the virus? Well, I think you saw things in March, which which I, I I didn't think were were possible. I mean, you saw uh, fixed income ETF trading at eight to ten percent discount of net asset value, and and the liquidity shock, even on 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 passive, was nothing like you had ever seen. And so, I think the environment in terms of active management, broadly speaking, and this is obviously true for everybody, is quite rich. There's a lot of things to do. There's a lot of alpha to be picked up. There's also risk. And, you know, it's going to be making sure you do bottom up work. You know, we have 75 credit analysts. They're going to need to do their job and make sure we buy the right bond. We have, as you know, a very big agency and non agency platform in mortgages. We need to make sure we do our work properly. But it is a good environment. We, we went from sitting here in January uh, thinking that um, 2020 was going to be on the boring side of things until you got to the election. And we had an enormous roller coaster. The roller coaster also means that uh, there's a time to play offense and, um, and a time to buy uh, cheap assets. And I think, I think that's where we are. So it's going to be a matter of navigating this. Sorry, John. Sorry. So I was going to say, can I ask you one last thing about PIMCO itself? When you were back at MAN, you were not afraid of doing sort of big mergers and acquisitions. Now, now you're at PIMCO. PIMCO has tended to do slightly smaller ones. If you have an industry that's changing for the reasons you've just said, um, is it going to be, do you see a period of consolidation in the fund management industry? And are I you interested do. in buying? So, so we're not, and I think I think we've been very clear, and I've been very clear about the fact that all organic growth is going to be, all all growth, sorry, will be organic, and yes, we may we may make small acquisition, but the reality is 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 Pimco will not change, and I think for us, focus is very essential. We're not trying to be all things to all people, and we have a strong culture, we have a strong investment culture, and it's much easier for us to add people than to buy people. Now, I can tell you. Tech and the size of the investment in tech is enormous. And I think that you will see smaller asset manager thinking twice about whether they want to remain independent and whether there are synergies to be achieved by merging down the line. Practically speaking, I think when people talk on Zoom, it is not easy to do merger. So until we can come back to face-to-face -face meeting, I don't think you'll see you'll see many mergers, broadly speaking, because they're just hard to do. I think at some point in time you need to break bread and look at each other in the in the eyes and say, "This is something we want to do. This is the right thing to do." And it's harder unless you know the person forever to do uh, by Zoom. I think that's one of the few things that. Uh, modern media has not been able to uh, to deliver. Do you, one last quick question to ask you about is globalization. You are a you know a composite global figure. You're a Frenchman living in in California, but and all your life you have followed these markets all the way around the world. Do you now see them splitting up much more? I think there's an issue with China in terms of the next six months. And John, you. You know, we first met a long time ago uh, yes. when you predicted uh, Obama becoming uh, the U.S. president. And I remember we all laugh at you, but you were 100 percent right. And we're going to have an election. A rare, where, except, a rare exception to the rule, but yes. A rare exception. But we're going to have an election where I think globalization uh, is going to be is going to be is going to be a big debate. And yes, it may be it may be debated in a way that neither you nor I uh, we like in terms of the detail, but China will be will be a big a big point of contention, and and in the Trump Biden election, I'm sure that uh, that will be 
there will be a big debate or, or, or political uh, uh, analyst, uh, Libby Cantrell often says it's six states which will decide uh, the election. And these six states all have a view, rightly or wrongly, on globalization and what it means for jobs and what it means for the economy. And that certainly will be a divide. Um, I, I grew up in a world where I thought that globalization was always a good thing, but I fully realized that if it doesn't come with retraining of lower skilled jobs, it creates deep inequality. And that's what you saw in the labor market in the US in terms of skilled workers versus unskilled workers. Um, and the competitiveness of the labor market in terms of people who can move and do new jobs and people who cannot. And, 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 and I think that explains a lot of what we've seen over the past, uh, the past few years. Do you think the choice in the election is going to be between a tough policy on China and an even tougher policy? Um, I, I don't know that. I think that um, if, you, if you talk to companies, outsourcing has had many benefits. I mean, we, we also have to recognize how beneficial NAFTA has been. We have to realize that many companies have become much more productive because of the outsourcing to China. I think many companies will say that they want to diversify away and have a supply chain that is more robust, if nothing else, because of COVID. I mean, many companies couldn't get the import done in March and April because China wasn't exporting. So you may see more um, outsourcing done in other country, but it will certainly be a highly contentious uh, debate. We'll see how it unfolds, and um, obviously it will have implication for us, and we'll adjust our portfolio accordingly. Well, we will look forward to discussing that with you. Manny Roman, CEO of PIMCO, thank you very much for speaking. John, to thank you for having me.